You're listening to the Qur'an Tafsir, Understanding the Word of Allah, a podcast dedicated to explaining the Qur'an presented by various reliable scholars. This podcast is powered by Seekers Hub Global. Visit SeekersHub.org for online courses, our Q&A service with reliable scholars, and engaging media. Blessings of all is the blessings of gathering together for his sake to Barakallah Ta'ala with fellow believers. And there's something that happens when the souls of believers come together. It's like a beautiful buffet and a beautiful feast. And one of the things, Alhamdulillah, that I can honestly say now, having been a Muslim longer than I, that was a non Muslim, Allah Ta'ala blessed me with this deen at the age of 19. And now that I'm approaching my 40th year, Alhamdulillah, that this is a faith that the more and more that you learn about it, the more and more that you practice it, and especially the more and more that you experience it, it just keeps getting more and more and more and more and more beautiful. And one of the things that I remember when I first became Muslim is that I would become excited, almost in a childlike way, every time that I would meet another believer. And that was something I should become socialized in the community and you learn about all of the differences and all these things, and there's no doubt that there's differences. But there's still something to be said for that childlike fitra state of appreciation whenever you see a believer. Just loving people who say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is one of the great things that when you that expand and expand the horizons of your mind and you learn to appreciate the unity that we have in our diversity. Because ultimately, that the unity is one of la ilaha illallah. That's what it all points back to. But then, is that the clear water-like nature of the truth of la ilaha illallah is that when it is reflected in the heart of the individual, is that it takes all different types of colors and just it presents itself in all different types of beautiful ways. And that the more and more people that you find from different backgrounds, from different places in the world, we tend to quote the Muslim countries, but actually is that there is a large percentage of Muslims as well that are actually living in countries where they are minorities. And I just came back from a trip to the southernmost island in the Caribbean, of Trinidad, and some of you might hail from somewhere, if not there, close by in that area. And alhamdulillah, to see believers that are still there, steadfast in their religion. They were brought there in the mid-19th century as indentured servants. And the reason that they were brought as indentured servants because at that time slavery was outlawed, but still they needed people to be able to put work in on the sugar cane plantations. And so that because that it was at that time controlled by England, is that they sent many people who were originally from India to that land to become indentured servants. But alhamdulillah, that Islam is still there with them to this day. And that they have the ability to build masajid then and then maintain them and to pass on this deen generation after generation after generation. And of all of the things that should be important to us, this is one of the most important things of all. This is the question that should preoccupy your mind and my mind. Is that how can we live up to the realities of this deen? But not only ourselves living up to the realities of this deen, how can we inculcate the meanings of this deen in the upcoming generation? This was the greatest concern of all of the people that came before us. Generation after generation, were one of them to meet their Lord, there were many people that could step up to be able to fulfill the tra- that trust, to be able to then, that not only live the meanings of this deen, to pass them on to the new generation. And there's no doubt there's always been challenges. But in our time, that there's unprecedented challenges. And one of the ways that we can understand this is that the three ways that you build a believer is through Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. This is how you build a believer. Is that no matter how detailed and nuanced the conversation becomes, ultimately, every aspect of our deen relates to either Iman or Islam or Ihsan. This is our deen in our in, in entirety, and these are the three aspects that make up a believer. But we also need to recognize is that there is a fourth dimension which could potentially undermine those three realities of the believer. And that we know that this stems back to the famous hadith of Gabriel, of Jabil, that we all know. 
when that Gabriel asked our Prophet وسلم, when the hour was, and then that the Prophet responded in the way that was befitting, is that the one who was being questioned does not know anyone better than the questioner, but then he asked him, what are its signs? And our Prophet then gave two of the overarching signs, whereby which then we can understand and put in a conceptualized fashion all of the detailed understandings of the various signs of the end of time. And one of the ways that we can see this concept of the signs of the end of time are the changing circumstances that we are exposed to as individuals in a community and an ummah over time. And so we know in each time that there are, un there are new challenges. And there are new that situations that we find ourselves in that we are required to respond to, being rooted in a principled fashion. And the meaning of principled here is being rooted in the meanings of Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. So it is important that we understand our time. It is important that we understand the special challenges in our time so that the roots of faith can be that firmly planted. Because it's like building anything else. And if you build on a surface, does not fit to build upon what is going to happen. That edifice is going to fall. And in fact, that you have to go in great detail to understand exactly the nature of the soil that you are building upon. And it is no different in a metaphoric sense in relation to building the believer with Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. And Alhamdulillah, in this regard, is that we know that if we take guidance from the Sunnah of our Prophet وسلم, which is the greatest guidance, the greatest thing that we can spend our time doing is reflecting upon the verses of the Qur'an and reflecting upon the greatest that interpretation of the Qur'an which is the life of our Prophet ﷺ. Here it is that we have keys for our success in this world and the next. In the, both the Qur'an and in the Sunnah of our Prophet ﷺ, is that we have everything that we need to be able to respond to any circumstance that we could ever be in in a way that is pleasing to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one of the many chapters in the Qur'an that we can find guidance in, and in fact the entire Qur'an is guidance, is that it begins with a plea for guidance in Surah Al-Fatiha. That we ask Allah to Brother Qutala, if dina sirat al mustaqim. This is the first supplication in the Quran, and that if we're praying our obligatory prayers, we are making that supplication at least 17 times. And if we're praying supererogatory prayers, then we're saying it even more. But then the Quran begins after that in the first part of Surah Al Baqarah, after Alif Lam Mim, Dalik al Kitab Nari Bafihi, Hudan lil Muttaqeen, that it is guidance for the people of Taqwa. So after asking for guidance, then Allah Ta'ala tells us that it is guidance. But it is guidance for who? It is guidance for the muntaqeen. And that this is why that you know that there are some people that will be raised with the Qur'an and there are other people that will be, that led to be go, led to be go astray. There are people that will be raised and there are people that will be abased. And so that we shouldn't ever be bothered, but we should be bothered but in a different way, that we shouldn't ever allow someone's critique of Islam, Muslims, or the Qur'an cause us that any consternation internally that somehow makes us put our deen into question, this is something that we know is going to happen. There are going to be people that are blinded by the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not see the truth of the Qur'an. But someone that has a disease such that they can't taste the sweetness of honey or even the sweetness of water, is that that gets back to their own particular issue. Other people can taste it just fine. And so this is what happens with diseased people. They tend to project their diseases on other people. And that they tend to interpret things with the very worst of interpretations with what is really in their own selves as opposed to the objective reality of that thing. And so Allah Ta'ala has given us then throughout the Qur'an from Surah Al-Fatiha to Surah Al-Baqarah until the very last Qur'an, Surah Al-Baqarah, the very last Surah in the Qur'an, Surah Al-Nas, all of that is guidance. And one of the meanings that we can take from the Surah that we'll just focus on very briefly tonight is that if we look at Surah Al-Sharah, you could call it Surah Al-Sharah or you could call it Surah Al-Inshirah. And then our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us something very important about our Prophet sallallahu is that he had a heart that was nashroor. Alam nashrah laka sadrak. Allah begins surah al-sharah with. And we've all heard this 
chapter recited, in particular this verse recited many, many times. But let's think about some of the implications of this. And I said heart, and when we talk about sadaq here, you could generally translate it as heart. Because the sadaq that is being referred to here is not the chest of the individual. This physical part of my body here that I'm touching outwardly. This is not that what was expanded. The Prophet's heart didn't, his chest wasn't expanded in that sense. What we're referring to here is the internal dimension. And so that we have different words in the Qur'an, and it is through scholarly analysis that we have to put them together to understand how they all fit together. And this is not definitive knowledge because that it doesn't come directly from a verse this way that we understand, but we know each one is distinct. You have what is called the sadr, this is a Qur'anic word, is that you also have what is called the fu'ad, which again you could translate as heart. Then we have the word that we normally associate the translation of heart with, which is the qal. But then you have something else as well. Allah also refers to the ulil al-bab. So you have the lub. These four that words, in general, they all refer to the heart. So some scholars say is that they are different layers, if you will, of the heart. And even though you could translate each one of them legitimately as heart in English, in reality, they are like different layers. So the scholars who put this forward say is that the outermost dimension of the heart is the sadaq. And then after the sadaq, the next layer, if you will, is the qalb. And then a more subtle layer is the fu'ad. And then the most subtle of layers is the lub, because that is the innermost core. And that when Allah Ta'ala is speaking here about the heart of our Prophet Sallallahu He says, Alam nashrah laka And one of the ways that the scholars understood this is that Allah expanded the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu with Iman. He expanded it with Iman and with knowledge of the Qur'an and with wisdom and also nubuwa in prophecy. The heart of our Prophet ﷺ was expanded with iman, with prophecy, with knowledge, and with wisdom ﷺ. And then when we pause here and we think about the story of Sayyidina Musa, is that when Moses was commanded to go to the Pharaoh, one of the things that he asked for was what? Rabbi shrah li sadri. He asked Allah wa ta'ala to expand his heart. And there was other things that he asked for as well. But if you look at what the commentators of the Qur'an say, is that our, the Prophet Moses was asking Allah wa ta'ala to expand his heart so that when he would go to the Pharaoh, is that he would have everything that he needed in order to be able to speak to him in a way that would benefit and he would be able to then that respond to the situation accordingly in a way that was pleasing to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the expanded nature of the heart of our Prophet sallallahu is critical for the mission that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him for. Now if you look and think about this, is that one of the most amazing things about our Prophet sallallahu is that his circle of concern was as vast as it could possibly be. His circle of concern was for all people, not just the people in his time, for all people that would come until Yom al Qiyamah. <laughs> and then we know through the Hadith al Shafa'ah, his circle of concern is even for the people that came before him. Because even people that were not directly from his Ummah, as we know it from the time that he received prophecy until the end of time, who were they going to go to on Yom al Qiyamah? All of creation is going to go to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not the other Prophets and Messengers. So his circle of concern and his circle of influence merged by way of khususiyah, by way of something special that our Lord gave him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was extremely concerned for people. And that this is part of his universality Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but as a result, is that he had an ability by way of potentiality to relate to every possible human being. Now if you think about the greatness of it, is that if you do not have an expanded heart, how are you going to be able to relate to people? 
especially people that are very different than you, especially people that are trying to harm you or to get in the way of the message that it is that you're trying to convey. How many of us, that the slightest thing that happens, the person right next to us steps on our toe and all of a sudden we feel frustrated. The person right next to us, although they should observe proper adab, but maybe that they actually burp or something and it doesn't smell too pleasant and we're, te we're extremely bothered by that. That someone just says something to us that we misinterpret as being rude and all of a sudden is it that's it. That if we look at the own state of our own hearts, is that they tend to be extremely narrow. They tend to be extremely narrow. Is that we find it difficult to even get along that if we come to the same masjid. We find difficult to get along if someone is not from the exact same place that we're from, sometimes even when they are from the place that we're from. But when we think about our Prophet وسلم, is that his heart was expanded enough such that he was for everybody. He was, a he was the only universal prophet. So it is as if the universal nature of the teachings of our Prophet وسلم, that he was able to convey the message in that way because of the expansion of his heart. And one of the other meanings of this is it relates to responsibility. And this is why that if you look at the two verses that come after that, there's different interpretations of that, but a valid interpretation is, is that we lifted your burden from you. And what does this burden stem from? The The burden of revelation. This was not something that was easy. This weighed heavily upon Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are going to cast upon you a heavy word. Is that the truth is heavy. The truth is not something that is easy. The truth is very, very heavy. Because once you accept truth, and you allow that truth to reside within yourself, or it's probably better said is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables you to be able to experience that truth and puts it in your heart, then you realize there are implications of that truth. Is that you start to see the world differently. You start to realize is that there's something that goes along with a recognition of truth and that is responsibility. And that is extremely, extremely heavy. And if it's not heavy, there's something wrong with us. It means that our heart hasn't been fully opened up to the truth. Is that responsibility goes along with the truth. And this is as someone who entered into this deen, is that I'm pleading with all of my fellow brothers, brothers and sisters that are Muslim, is that when you interact with people, interact with people with the utmost care. Interact with people realizing there is a responsibility upon your shoulder. I can't tell you that how many people get pushed away from this deen because of the things that Muslims do. People get in their cars and they think that all of a sudden they're no longer mukallafin, is that they're no longer legally responsible. Because of the pseudo nature that the car creates and that's one step removed where you're not having a personal interaction with the person that's driving the car next over and you think that you can cut them off or you think that you can say something rude to them and mutter something underneath your lips. Is that no, from the time you wake up in the morning, is that every interaction that you have, whether you're in the car, whether you're in the store, whether you're talking to someone on the phone and they can't see you, or whether that you are passing by them on the street, every interaction is extremely important. And it is absolutely necessary is that we feel the responsibility that is upon our shoulders in relation to every single interaction that we have. This is very, very serious. Because you would be surprised is that things that you do in a positive sense, is it for you that it might be deemed something small. But for that person that next to you, it might not be small at all. And you would be surprised as well how people notice certain things. People notice things. And sometimes it takes them though, long periods of time to notice things. Is it your coworker that is struggling 
that is going through a divorce, that has all kinds of problems, is going to have to wash away their troubles in the bar at night because that they can't find any solace in any other way. Is that when they see you consistent, and when they see you lighthearted, and they see you smiling, and they see you having good character, even though they might make fun of you at first, is that over a long period of time, they will notice what it is that you have and what it is that they are missing. And they will be drawn and they will be attracted towards it. And I've had people in my own family that actually mention this to me. Is that this is very, very real. And so that Allah Ta'ala says in relation to our Prophet Muhammad is that these, that this burden of prophecy is that it has made your back heavy. Is that this is the burden of responsibility that is placed upon our shoulders. And our Prophet وسلم, is that he wanted the companions who sat with him and spent time with them to be able to understand this very clearly. And he wanted to inculcate the meaning of the importance of conveying this message to the next generation. And how many hadith do we have of our Prophet وسلم, that encourage us, that encourage people to be able to hear what it is that they need to hear and then to be able to convey that. And that he encouraged the people who were present to convey this to the people who are not present, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he has beautiful statements like he said things like, May Allah Ta'ala make a man radiant. Whoever hears my words, understands them, and then conveys them in the way that he understood them. Is that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that he realized that he spoke about the things of utmost importance. And this is of all things in the modern world. One of the greatest contributions that we can make is that in a time where people become decentered, in a time where people have a vacuum at the level of their being, where something is missing, no matter how many things are being taken care of by way of modern technology, is that the only thing that is really going to fulfill the human being is purpose. This is the only thing that is going to fulfill the human being. Is that alhamdulillah, that we have teachings that are still centered. Is that, no, we did not go through a reformation. And even though we might hear this silly rhetoric at, on TV about how this is the problem of Muslims that they didn't go through, re through a reformation. The people that say something like that know nothing about Western European history. They know nothing about that the mire that they are trapped into this day because they do not know what any of the knowledge that they have means. And a day that everything is being put into question and everything is relative and people are trapped in a dichotomy about trying to wonder what is, re what is real. At the, what is at the level of the mind or what is experienced in the way that things are run in creation. They are trapped in an ever-ending abyss that they're never going to find meaning in their lives until is that they want to take the first step to understand that there is other ways that are beyond your way of knowing. And our Prophet's teachings, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are all encompassing of every dimension of the human being. Everything that relates to the previous realms, this world, and everything that's going to come inwardly and outwardly at the level of the mind and the level of the body and the level of the soul. And that he was that perfectly positioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because that he had a transcendent point of reference, whereby which then, that everything that we know in the seen and the unseen realm could be understood, is that he was gifted a knowledge of nubuwa, of prophecy, sallallahu alayhi wa and it was this knowledge that will put everything else in context. And when we understand this knowledge, is that we have that which we need then to make sense of everything. And when we talk about a life of purpose, is that this is not a life simply of just the concept of purpose. Is that we want to live every moment in our lives with purpose. And the more that we can learn to do this, and the more that we maintain presence within that moment, and to do that what our Prophet encouraged us to do, وسلم, and give life to his sunnah, وسلم, the more then that every moment will be meaningful and collectively, is that it will start to open up the heart and enable it to reflect what it was meant to reflect. And ultimately, is that true purpose is that understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one in control. Understanding what are His attributes, 
understanding what the Quran teaches us about our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. That ultimately is a life of purpose, where then that we worship our Lord based upon knowledge, and that the seeds of ma'rifa are planted in this world, and that we harvest them most importantly in the next world. And if we take this to where we began in closing before we turn it over to Sheikh Faraz, is that one of the ways that we can move towards a heart that is expanded is to make the same dua that Moses made. Is to ask Allah wa ta'ala, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. And to recite Surah al Inshirah, Surah al Sharh, Alam nashrah laka sadr. And then remind ourselves when we deal with other people, is that if we get irritated at every little rub, how do we ever expect ourselves to be polished? Is that we need to be able to be bigger than that, than to be so petty, to be worried about that little things that we all of a sudden focus on and we become hypercritic, hypercritics in relation to is that we have a mission and once we understand that mission is that then we will understand the importance that every interaction that we have with every single person is of the utmost importance there are three words that they go hand in hand and it's to the extent that we understand these words and put them into practice we'll be able to do just that they are muhimma and they are that hem and himma. All of them come from the same root. Your muhimma is your duty in life, your purpose, what you've been created for. Your hem is your concern that results and ensues as a result of understanding what your muhimma is. And then your himma is your resolution that you have in your spiritual aspiration, whereby which then you outwardly serve creation based upon an understanding of your mission and based upon a deep concern for people after you realize the responsibility that is upon your shoulders. May Allah ta'ala bless us to be able to realize what that responsibility is and to convey it in the ways that is pleasing to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala expand our hearts and bless us to be able to be inspired with the guidance of Sayyidina Muhammad Thank you for listening to the Qur'an Tafsir, Understanding the Word of Allah. Help Seekers Hub give light to millions around the world by becoming a monthly donor at seekershub.org slash donate. Your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada.